The idea of owning land. An old notion forged by the sword is quietly undergoing a profound transformation. However natural owning land may seem in our culture, in the long sweep of human existence it is a fairly recent invention. Where did this notion come from? What does it really mean to own land? Why do we, in our culture, allow a person to draw lines in the dirt and then have almost complete control over what goes on inside those boundaries? What are the advantages, the disadvantages, and the alternatives? How might a humane and sustainable culture reinvent the ownership connection between people and the land? Good day. This is Nation in Conversation. We welcome you from Forum Homini in the cradle of humankind. Nation in Conversation was created to stimulate dialogue. We discuss pertinent issues that have a direct impact on the agriculture sector as well as the broader community. Remember to join the conversation on Twitter at Nation Converse. Land reform remains a contentious issue. Today we discuss the current challenges in South Africa and different perceptions around this topic. Joining me in the studio is Mpumelelo Nkabela, editor of the Suwetan, and Max Depria, political analyst and writer. Max, I want to start the conversation when the first Europeans arrived in South Africa. There was different ideas about land, land usage, and land ownership. Mm. What was the position? Vastly different. And it's something that we still struggle with right now today. Private land ownership, where you peg off a piece of land and that is yours. You've got papers to show. Nobody's allowed to take it away. One day you can sell it or leave it to your children, but nobody's allowed to take it away. Nobody's even allowed to go on it if you don't want them to. That is, was the, the concept that developed in Europe. It didn't exist in Africa. It didn't exist in South America. It didn't exist in some societies in the Middle East and in, in, in South Asia. And when, in the 17th century, the settlers came, they didn't think twice. This is the system we have to have. And it seems there was never a real conversation because when the, the settlers came, the, the Khoi occupied most of the Western Cape, but they, they had very vague ideas of, of who lives where. You know, the Kachokwa lived in the Swartland and then, but it was like moving and nobody had private ownership. And these guys came and said, well, will you sell me this part or I'm going to get on my horse and travel for two hours hammer in a pig and two hours and two hours and that, that is my land. And in this, in the, in this clash of cultures, um, a lot of wrong was done to people. The history is full of stories of, of chiefs telling a fur tracker leader, I'll give you this land for five horses. And now when we look back, you understand that chief never meant that this man could have that land forever and ever and ever. And exclusive. And exclusive to him, and you can't, you can't go on it if he doesn't say so. Uh, it was more like good neighborliness, I'm going to allow you to use this land. And so there are lots of stories, and, and I think white, a lot of white people, a lot of Afrikaners, like my ancestors, come and say, but we didn't steal your land. My great-great-great-grandfather made a deal with your chief. And in some cases, that is really true. In some cases, like in the Western Cape, it just there was nothing like that. The Khoi never gave land to anybody. They were just subjugated. So we have to go back and say, this is one of the, the historic injustices in the society and the historic mistakes and massive misunderstandings that we had. We have it again today. We have, for instance, the economic freedom fighters saying there should be no private ownership of land. All agricultural land should now be taken by the state and then they can dish it out to who can use it. Now, that will be clearly be an, an absolute disaster. So we, we have the problem of now that we are a more just society, now that we are a democracy uh, and we have a, a government voted in by the people, now we're caught up with another reality and that is you cannot undo the injustice of the past without massive economic hardship. Because if you were to give all the agricultural land back to the state and they would dish it out to all the people, we would not have food in a few years' time. 
uh, our economy would be would suffer vastly. We would have massive unemployment, and we would be an unstable nation. Zimbabwe showed that. I mean, how many South Africans, black South Africans, hail Mugabe for doing Africans proud. We took back the land. Well, more than two million Zimbabweans will have to be fed from outside Zimbabwe this year. I saw this morning a statistic, 20, 30, 40,000 Zimbabweans a month are now coming to South Africa. That system didn't work. A lot of those black farmers are very successful, but many of them aren't. Agriculture is not only land. That's the emotional part. The emotional part is very, very important. But the, the, the real part, the real reality is, it is where we, we, we prepare food, we make food, and we, we supply um, labor. And, and those facets, if you throw them away, we're all in deep trouble. Later, I want to talk about the fact that there were successful black farmers in Southern Africa. But your case, Mpumalelo, farming played a big role in where you are today. Is that not the case? Yes, true. Um, uh, in fact, uh, um, the history of my family and my community generally, where I come from in the east, eastern part of Mpumalang, um, we have that history or legacy of having been dispossessed of our land. Um, in the late 19th century and some of the land was dispossessed obviously in the uh, early 20th century after the 1913 land act people were sort of disoriented and their uh, pattern of uh, food production was uh, vastly disturbed because they were obviously moved to areas that were less productive uh, far from uh, rivers and lakes where they could source uh, water so, but I just want to comment a little bit on what uh, 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 Marx has just said. I think he omitted the fact that the, the, the history is not so much about the different uh, cultural aspects between the Europeans who came to settle in South Africa and the indigenous uh, Africans who were found here. There was also, uh, coming from Europe, the issue of race relations that was exported into South Africa. Um, how should um, uh, Africans uh, be treated by, by other races? So we all know the history of why the Africaners decided to um, uh, do a great trek from the southern tip of Africa up north. It was precisely uh, partly because of, uh, one, they needed property that they could own and they could settle without being interfered with by the other Europeans that they didn't agree with. But part of that disagreement with the other Europeans was how they should treat black people. So they felt like, but why shouldn't we be allowed to own slaves and treat them as other people treat them as slaves? And then they, they wanted the right to do that. So with that mentality, as people were tracking, not only were these dubious land deals that it refers to done, but also there was also damage in terms of race relations with the indigenous uh, population. Production patterns obviously disturbed. The ownership patterns of land was also disturbed. The, the crucial uh, ingredient that the Europeans introduced in South Africa, as he correctly points out, was a private ownership uh, of land. And as things stand now in South Africa, we have embraced the private uh, uh, property ownership, not just land, but broadly. So you have a situation now where you have to redistribute land, which was dispossessed under a different system that the Africans were used to. But it must be now uh, redistributed under a different pattern where there's now private property ownership is entrenched. So how to do that is what we actually set sitting here. That's the part that is getting uh, other people riled. And the reason why Mugabe becomes a hero is not because his land policies are productive or useful. It is because of the race thing that I'm referring to. People are always willing to go back to the race question, what the land means to them in relation to race. So the land the disposition means I'm subjugated. It means I'm less of a human. Uh, uh, my land has been taken away. So when the land is, is, is taken forcefully from the uh, uh, descendants of the Europeans, people celebrate, not because they're going to suddenly have food, but it's because of the, the racial sentiment to it. And we shouldn't downplay it when we talk about land questions. All of the, 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 the factors are important. You have to get uh, back the land help people to get productive. The old production systems of communal land are no longer working. So you have to turn them to the new methods of private property ownership, have collateral to the land, make the land tradable, 
make them appreciate that system because there's no other system. Um, and, and in addition to that, uh, you're going to gain peaceful uh, uh, race relations as a result. Uh, land won't be associated with uh, depravity among uh, black people. We're going to get back to the point of the current status of the value of the agriculture sector, but also how important it is to solve this problem. Nation in Conversation will be back right after the break. Welcome back to Nation in Conversation. Today's discussion centers around land reform and the current challenges in South Africa. Max, we've talked now about the history of the South African land question, but having said all of that, there were successful black farmers in South Africa when the colonial people arrived. Oh, absolutely. Um, when, when the Dutch settlers first arrived in the 16th and 17th centuries, they were astonished to see these big herds of cattle that the Khoi Khoi had. When they moved to meet with the Kosa speaking people in the Eastern Cape, they were surprised to see what fantastic farmers they were, not only cattle, but also planting sorghum and maize. And the Zulu speaking people were famous for their herds, beautiful herds of cattle. Cattle uh, among black farmers had always been a part of the culture and part of social status. So it was important. Uh, it wasn't a hobby. Um, so right through that period, through the 19th century, um, after the, 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 we had discovered, they had discovered mines, uh, uh, di diamonds and gold, small black farmers started trading, especially vegetables, very competitively to mines and mine workers. And after the World War, that continued. Um, and they were very successful commercial farmers all over the show. And then came the 1913 Native Land Act, which destroyed this all and created Bantustan, 7%, where all black people had to go and, and left the, the rest of the land for the white. So all that agricultural potential of, of active farming was more or less destroyed. Um, and even then where there, there were they, where they allowed exceptions, like in, in um, areas around Pretoria, Hamanskral. Uh, we had farmers in the 1920s and 30s, black farmers who bought the land, or groups of farmers, and they were commercial successes. And eventually they were forcibly removed because they were black people in a white area. So yes, a very proud history of, of farming and good farming. And it's not only us, it's the region. If we look at, at Namibia, our neighboring state, where the Herero farmers are world famous for being the best cattle ranchers in Africa. And you can go into Mozambique and into Zambia and in Botswana, and there, there's a long, proud history. We see it today. There are a number of commercial, big commercial farmer, farmers, black farmers in, in, this, in South Africa today. People who export their produce, people who are really big businessmen. It's not something new. The, if you look at the primary agriculture sector and you take the value of the land, the value of the, of the, of the animals on the land, value of the infrastructure and the value of the equipment on the land, it's roughly 360 billion rand. That's massive. If it was listed, it would have been the eighth biggest company in South Africa. And on a production scale, it can be compared to some of the best farmers in the world. If you then look against the background and you look at more communal farm, there's a massive yield gap. Surely there is an opportunity in that yield gap. And that surely also means that we need to find a model. There is space for a model for everybody to win. I think there should be, uh, and we should be working towards that. Um, in fact, looking at the, the numbers we've just stated around the value of agriculture in South Africa, if you only look at the monetary value, you would understate the importance of agriculture because what it does, sustaining you and I, biologically and otherwise, um, that's at the heart of life. So, and that, you can't put a price there. It's priceless. Um, so that's why it's important that we should treat this as a very uh, treasurable asset for the country. And whatever we do around it should be something that is nurturing, something that's very progressive, something that's very inclusive, something that is not held back too much uh, by the past. We, we have a terrible past, and uh, I think that the Constitution makes it very clear 
that everybody admits that we come from a terrible past. But the Constitution also talks about an inclusive future, a non-racial inclusive future where everybody uh, has uh, feel they have a hold and they feel they have a, they have, they have a stake in, in, the, in the future of the country and they have a contribution to make. It also talks about all talents being recognized um, and including some of the talents that may have been destroyed in the past that Mark Stupir refers to. We may have to go back to that and resuscitate people's potential for the benefit of all. It shouldn't be about a zero-sum game. It shouldn't be about a winner takes all. Um, I always say that uh, a winner takes all mentality is the one that results into what we have seen in Zimbabwe, where instead of growing the cake that can be shared, you're actually leaving a country with leftovers, which nobody can feed on. Max, two points. The emotional issue of land even today, in terms of, uh, of a point of departure. But add to that, where does the, the traditional land structures fit into the, pro the debate? Well, if, if land reform were an agricultural economic problem, we could solve it before the sun goes down. Land reform is not an agricultural issue. It's a political issue. You have to deal with the political issue while not neglecting the other part, the real part, the food security part, the job creation part, the, the rural stability part. We are two thirds uh, urbanized in South Africa, 67% more or less. And yet the cry for we want our land back come from middle class, plus middle class professional people in Johannesburg. I saw it last week at a, at a public forum where this highly educated woman with, the, with degrees and degrees said, I, I won't feel whole if I don't have my land back. She doesn't really want to go and farm, but it's that thing that Mpumalela also referred to, that emotional thing of almost saying, okay, I don't want to go and farm, but I also don't want white people to own my, my ancestors' land. And that's the one that we need to to fix. So we need to fix the fact that we need a new black farmers, establish them on the land, help them, support them, and make them uh, commercially viable because we cannot afford to waste one square meter of land in this country, especially not now with the economy going down. We need every square meter to be productive. We need farmers who are going to be serious about farming. But how then do we still this other, this emotional thing of, uh, I'm not whole as an African because white people have my land. Well, we have to work very hard on that and be very clear about the message. 99% of white people do not own land anyway. Agricultural land is owned by about 30,000 people, 30,000 white people. There are only 30,000 white farmers left. I do not have land. Um, most people do not have land. Um, the land is now in the, in, the, in the hands of a few foreigners, and we're, treating, we're dealing with that, but mostly in, in, in the hands of people who are actively farming, who are producing maize and meat and wheat and whatever. And we have to be realistic about that. And Zimbabwe wasn't. Uh, and, and if you look at the history of land reform in Africa, in South America, they all started with, the land reform processes started with nationalizing all the land and giving it back to the peasants. And then it takes about 10, 15 years and then the economy is down the drain and everybody is hungry and poor and then they slowly start introducing new models. It's a theme over the whole world. So why don't we learn from that? Why do we go straight to say, we're going to chase all commercial farmers off the land, we're going to, the state will take it all back and, and then we'll dish it out. It won't work, but we have to find a way of making the political one and the, and the reality, the economic reality work together. After the break, I want to get your views on the future. Nation in Conversation will be back after the break. Welcome back to Nation in Conversation. We continue our discussion around land reform. If you look in the next 5, 10, 15 years, how do you see the agriculture sector? Well, I think that there's a, a great potential in our agricultural sector. As you pointed out earlier, um, the value is immense in terms of uh, monetary measurement and also the other aspect I referred to the priceless nature of our agricultural sector um, it feeds millions of people and we're able to export and foreign exchange 
employ a lot of people uh, in and that, that sector. that asset should be looked after. Should be looked after for everybody to benefit. And here is what I think should happen for everybody to benefit. Firstly, we need to get the legislation, uh, the political issue that Max re re referred to, the, the leg legislative component of it settled. So for the last 21 years as a democracy, we haven't come up with a, a legislation that would have um, transformed the agricultural sector in a progressive manner, uh, quick enough for everybody to have certainty, for everyone to be settled about what they should be getting out of it. Uh, so we have had a lot of uh, heckling around, people um, w demanding certain things which are impractical, even in terms of the very same political settlement that we are in. Um, so you need legislation that is very predictable, that is very clear. You need government that will set proper policy targets that everyone is clear about. And, and thirdly, you need commitment from all stakeholders, from uh, farmers, from the agribusiness uh, sector as a whole, agro-processing, from the food chains, the workers, and generally society must uh, support this sector and it must demand stability and, and very productive uh, outcomes. And we also need to be open. I mean, debates like this are important because they encourage everybody to participate. Nobody should be left out of the agricultural debate. The fact that I'm, I'm not a farmer doesn't mean that I don't have an opinion. The fact that you know I'm, I'm, I'm merely a consumer doesn't mean that I'm, I don't have an opinion about how the food is produced and who produces it. And the fact that I'm a modern South African uh, who is not interested in farming, who is interested in high tech stuff, doesn't mean that I'm oblivious about the history of, of land dispositions in the country and the fact that I have an interest in, in, in getting an inclusive future in the agricultural sector. I think once all stakeholders recognize those kinds of factors, I think we're in for a um, for a good showing um, uh, uh, going forward. I think that, as I said in, in, in my speech at the Free State Agriculture, we must stop this backyard bickering among ourselves as South Africans and find a solution that will propel us to be big drivers of getting a bigger market share uh, uh, of uh, the export uh, sector globally. Traditional leaders must also come on board here. I think the communal land ownership patterns needs to be broken up in my opinion. Because if you're gonna empower uh, a small holders, they should be able to trade on their land. They should be able to borrow on that land. Be able to access the financial system. Exactly, because you can't compete with the established uh, white farmers who can borrow against their land and you can't borrow against your very little uh, small holding there. Um, um, the land bank will have to review its role. And, and if the commercial banks perhaps can enter in that sector, perhaps the land bank can find a mechanism, a model that might accommodate communal, communal land ownership as well as the need for financing for it to grow. I don't think I can make the small plot that my uh, grandmother uh, used to farm uh, commercially viable. Uh, where will I get the capital? Who's gonna fund a farm that is communally owned, owned by the chief, held in trust by the chief on behalf of the community. The banks don't want that. Unless perhaps the land bank reforms and takes, takes that into account, or the chiefs give up that uh, right to hold land on behalf of people, and people can own their own land. Uh, if we don't do that, if we don't find solutions to that, we can talk about agricultural reform at a, at a bigger scale, but at the more personal level, how does it affect me as a South African who wants to farm? you know, it might be a problem. Max, in this discussion, the goodwill was noted. Your view of the future, and is there enough goodwill? Yeah. Land is the biggest resource that we have. If we're talking about land, we're talking about the soil that defines South Africa. It defines us as a nation. We occupy, what we have in common is we occupy this land. So we have to find out we have to find a way to live together on this land and share it in a way that makes nobody deeply unhappy and make sure that we can feed our people. And, and th those are the broad things. And if you start talking about that, then I think I see enough goodwill. The first point was that I was very pleasantly surprised in my interaction with organized agriculture, how progressive and pragmatic farmers have become and say, we know that our future is at stake. If we don't take part in this transformation, we will lose it all.
which is the correct position. I see massive initiatives. So I'm very pleasantly surprised. There's, I think white farmers get a bad rap. People say, does he boss up, say Baki? Uh, that is an old picture. That, that doesn't work anymore. Uh, the new picture is of a, a business person on land, scientific farming, high yields, um, high production, investing in your, in your, in your labor properly. So you, you, you have a loyal uh, relationship on the farm. I think what we need to do is keep the pace of land reform fast enough to keep it out of the clutches of reckless politicians. Because reckless politicians, like they've done elsewhere, are already, and will most definitely in future, seize on this issue of land, because it's so emotional, and abuse it for own political ends. If we allow reckless populist politicians to, to control this debate, to dominate this debate, then it would be too late. So there's an imperative on all of us to get this transformation going fast enough to keep ahead of the politicians. And I'm disappointed in the way that the state had been able to affect this change. I think the bureau bureaucracies are too weak. There's too much wa 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 wastage and not enough uh, good policy. And, and I'm surprised at the initiatives from, from farmers that have really made a fundamental difference. And that's the way to go. We've got to go faster. Otherwise, if we wait for the populists to take hold of the debate, uh, we're all in deep trouble. Thank you very much. Thanks for your participation, gentlemen. Thank you for taking part in the conversation. Visit our website, nationinconversation.co.za, and follow us on Twitter, at Nation Converse. Please join us again as we continue with our conversations with various thought leaders over the next few weeks. From me, Theo Foster, goodbye. Changing.